Okay, this is Dr. Mintz here, and we want to go through a case of head trauma. Now, this is a rather exceptional case. This is a 16-year-old male who has been in a car accident. 16-year-old male. Now, I'll just give you an overview, and that's usually how I'll start out with cases like this, just so you can kind of look it over, get a feeling for what's going on here. And let's take a look at a few things. First of all, we have to identify what's wrong, and, and hopefully it's clear to you that there's hemorrhage. There are several areas of hemorrhage. So the question becomes, where are these areas of hemorrhage. Well, this is in the right lateral ventricle. So here is the frontal horn of the right lateral ventricle and left lateral ventricle. Here is the occipital horn of the right lateral ventricle and left lateral ventricle. This larger area here is often called the atrium. Okay, so there's blood in both lateral ventricles, and of course it's heavier than CSF, so it goes to the de dependent part, so it goes to the back and rather than the, the frontal horns. So there's blood more in the right lateral ventricle than the left. Okay, and here, you can see that the blood in the right lateral ventricle here going from the occipital horn of the right lateral ventricle goes up here into the body of the right lateral ventricle. Okay. And then it merges with some blood that is right here above the ventricle. And if you think about a sagittal plane, in a sagittal plane, what structure is right above the body of the lateral ventricle? And that is the corpus callosum. So many people have difficulty visualizing hemorrhages in the corpus callosum, but that's what this would be. See, if you go right under it, you're getting right into the lateral ventricle, and you're very close to the midline, so this is in the body of the corpus callosum, just to the left of the midline. And this, too, is in the corpus callosum, kind of extending over here. It's sitting on top of the blood here that's in the right lateral ventricle. Okay, so you have intraventricular hemorrhage, and then what some people call intraparenchymal hemorrhage, which is basically just brain hemorrhage, hemorrhage in the brain. And then you have some blood inferior to the right lateral ventricle. Well, what would be in that area? The thalamus is what's located here. So here you have the basal ganglia and the thalamus. So you have the caudate nucleus, the putamen, is in this area, and the globus pallidus is in here. So this kind of wedge-shaped area here is all basal ganglia, and back here is the thalamus. So you have an area of hemorrhage in the right thalamus, and how about this big area of hemorrhage there? That, too, would be called intraparenchymal, not a term I use, but most people do, and it involves a portion of the basal ganglia here on the left, not the caudate, but the putamen and globus pallidus. The putamen and globus pallidus are right here in this wedge-shaped area, which is sometimes called the lentiform nucleus, just describing its lens-shaped appearance. Caudate nucleus, the head of the caudate nucleus is here because the caudate nucleus actually arches up and parallels the lateral ventricle. So you have a hemorrhage here in the posterior portion of the left basal ganglia and extending here farther back, probably involving some of the left thalamus and some of the deep white matter in this part of the hemisphere. Okay. Now if we go down here, this is blood where? In the fourth ventricle. Very important to understand that and appreciate what this anatomy is here. Okay, and if we go from the bottom up, as you come through the foramen magnum, the first part of the brain you're, you see here, not particularly well, is the medulla. And these are the cerebellar hemispheres, of course. And here is the medulla here. 
cerebellar hemispheres. That bright dot there is the basilar artery. And as you get up here, this is where the pons is. So the pons is here, and this is fourth ventricle. So the fourth ventricle is filled with blood. And there's also blood, it doesn't show up real well, in the cisterns, which is just the fluid-filled spaces around different areas of the brain. This is the cella tersica. Okay. The, this is the midbrain, and you don't see it well here particularly, but that little white area right there, these are the cerebral peduncles. This is where the cerebral hemispheres connect with the brainstem, the cerebral peduncles. So a critical structure here, and in between the uh, cerebral peduncles is a little angle area there called the interpeduncular cistern. It's between the, the peduncles. So there's blood there, and that's often the first place you see subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now going back down, follow the fourth ventricle going up, and you see it goes through that little slit there, that little dot there, into the third ventricle. So the third ventricle connects to the fourth ventricle through a little dot, a very narrow canal called the cerebral aqueduct. We will see that here and here and here into the fourth ventricle. So lots of intraventricular hemorrhage subarachnoid hemorrhage, intraparenchymal hemorrhage. Here's a little hemorrhage that involves the lateral portion of the left temporal lobe, and that would be called a contusion when blood fills the little spaces, the, the cortical sulci of the brain. That is subarachnoid space. This is probably a contusion, so it's hemorrhage of the brain. The brain took a wallop right there. And there's some hemorrhage in the substance of the brain, and very often that will spill out into the sulci and produce subarachnoid blood as well. This looks extraaxial. Extraaxial means outside of the brain, outside the main brain, cerebral hemispheres and structure. Extraaxial. And this could be subdural, I suppose. Probably, probably some component is subdural as I look at it. Now this is the tentorium. Remember the tentorium separates the cerebellum from the cerebral hemispheres. The cerebellum is below the tentorium, cerebellum and pons. And then as you go up, this is the edge of the tentorium and it's a sheet-like structure that separates it, the, the posterior fossa, from the rest of the brain. This little notch here is called the tentorial incisura, very important structure. Here it is, the tentorial incisura, and these are called, the, this is the free margin of the tent. That means that the tent is actually tent shaped. So imagine a sheet like thing that's right here attached here on one edge and another edge of it is attached here and all the way around and then as you go up this area gets closer and closer together so that sheet like structure is kind of tent shaped and it comes almost to a point as you get up here. Well it does come to a little bit of a peak and that is why the tentorium is called the, the tentorium. It's a tent. We often call it the tent. And remember, it's the posterior fossa that is beneath the tentorium. This is the free margin, and you need to get that picture in your mind. You'll see it better on coronal images, but on this one image, you're seeing cerebral hemisphere here, cerebellum, and cerebral hemisphere here. Because this part of the cerebellum is poking up following this tent that is getting higher and higher but narrower toward the midline. So here again you have a small portion of the cerebellum poking up between the two margins of the tentorium. 
in your cerebral hemisphere, cerebral hemisphere, but this is cerebellar in the middle. This would be where the midbrain is located. Okay, so the tentorium is made of dura, and the fact that it's thick over here suggests that there's some subdural blood layering along the tentorium. The fact that there's a bright line here, white, indicates there's blood in that cisternal space, which is called the quadrigeminal cistern, quadrigeminal or midbrain cistern. All right, now that we've kind of gone through some of that, and you'll, see, you'll hear these things again, but do try to get them as clearly in mind as possible. The big interesting aspect of this case, and it's very unfortunate, 16-year-old, are these little dots. This dot here, uh, there's one over here. This one out here is out too far. We're looking for little white matter dots. Okay, so there's one here. One there, one there. Now look, one here, one here, one here, here. All those little dots, and here's a big dot, but it's the same kind of process in the white matter. And now you have little streaks. These are what you call white matter shear injur injuries. White matter shear injuries are important because very often they're present and we don't even see them. So many patients will come in and they have a Glasgow coma scale, and you should be familiar with that a little bit, Glasgow coma scale of let's say three or four, which means they're in neurologically in very bad shape. And we look at head CT and it's either normal or nearly normal. And we surmise, well, since they're in bad shape and we don't see much, it must be white matter shear injury, which is usually too small to even appreciate. In this case, this 16-year-old has so much of it so prominent, and here's one too, in the right frontal lobe, white matter. This is a devastating injury, and the reason is because whatever you see is usually just the tip of the iceberg, and that's why usually we see very little or nothing. This patient has lots of these little areas of hemorrhage which means that there are even more areas of abnormality than what we see. So this is a horrendous brain injury. This is the most white matter shear injuries I've ever seen in any case. This is a fresh case just came up. We also will go to MRI if we suspect white matter shear injuries because MRI will detect blood products that are in, are present only in very small amounts. So m you may have a normal brain CT, let's say normal like this area here looks pretty normal. You go to MRI and you see dot, 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 and that's because the MRI is very sensitive to the blood products of any hemorrhage, and that's because it, blood contains iron. Hemosiderin contains iron and iron in different stages. So we do special sequences that are very sensitive to blood and we see signal abnormalities indicating white matter shear injury. So be aware that white matter shear injury is a devastating type of injury. We often don't see any abnormality on CT even when there is significant and multiple white matter shear injuries and they are much better seen on MRI. This is just the unusual case where it showed up well on CT. The reason that people get white matter shear injuries usually is that there's some ro rotational or accelerational type of force, typically rotational. And what happens is because the gray matter and white matter have different physical properties, they accelerate or decelerate at slightly different rates. And so you get tearing. You get tears in the white matter axons right near where the white matter meets the gray matter. You see, and you can see the gray matter here is a little lighter color, and the white matter here is a little lower attenuation. 
So that's where these occur. White matter shear injuries tend to occur at gray white matter interfaces. And it's because there's a rotational force and because of the differential acceleration of one kind of material, white matter compared to another, that is what causes the tear in the white matter that causes this often de devastating injury.